For this module, we are going to talk about criminal profiling. Here, we're going to go through a brief outline of the history of profiling. In the 1940s, psychiatrist Walter Langer was commissioned during World War II to construct a psychodynamic profile of Hitler. In 1957, Psychiatrist James Brussels worked with the New York Police Department to construct a profile of the Mad Bomber. In the 1970s and 80s, the FBI became involved in psychological profiling and popularized this technique. In between the 1990s and 2003, there have been many attempts to scientize profiling and move the practice beyond the purview of the FBI. Criminal profiling is the process of drawing inferences about a criminal's personality, behavior, motivation, and demographic characteristics based on crime scenes and other evidence. As noted in the previous slide, the techniques of criminal profiling were pioneered by the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit in Quantico, Virginia. These techniques have been used in the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, Finland, Germany, Sweden, and the Netherlands. However, there are only about a dozen FBI agents who specialize in profiling and their profiling techniques were most often applied to cases involving serial killers. To create a tentative description or profile of the criminal, profilers analyze the crime scenes, gather information about the victims, and study both police and autopsy reports. Profiles are used to provide leads for police and to focus the efforts of investigators. For example, officers might be told to look for a white male in his 20s who works night shifts and lives in a particular part of the city. A profile might also be used to set a trap for a criminal. For instance, if police are looking for a serial killer who preys on young prostitutes with long dark hair, an officer with long dark hair may pose as a prostitute in an effort to attract and entrap the killer. Overall, a profile helps investigators to look for a particular type of person and to ignore other types of people. When questioning suspects, a profile may suggest questions to ask and topics to explore. Profilers who have worked at the FBI emphasize the importance of the signature aspect of a crime. This signature is the distinctive personal aspect of the crime that presumably reveals the personality of the killer. John Douglas, one of the agents who developed the FBI's system, explained that the methods used to abduct, transport, or dispose of victims may change but the signature will, will remain relatively constant because it is why the killer does it, the thing that fulfills him emotionally, the emotional reason he's committing the crime in the first place. In order to construct a profiler, profilers rely on the signature and method of operation, or MO. The MO refers to how the offender committed the crime. In other words, it tells the situational and contextual factors that are involved in a crime. Since it described how the offender committed the crime, the MO can change over time. On the other hand, a signature stays the same. It may be refined over time, but the basic signature stays the same. Here are some of the factors that can shape the MO. First are trade and professional experience. These are best thought of as the background factors that help the offender in carrying out the crime. Some other factors include criminal experience and confidence, how much contact they've had with the criminal justice system, media and pop culture, 
what their mood or mental state may be, and other unknown or unplanned influences that are sometimes known as X factors. With regard to factors that refine the signature, the most significant are the offender's personality and psychopathology. These include any combination of behaviors, emotions, and thoughts. Another important factor is the evolution of the offender's fantasy. This has been best defined as, quote, something the offender has to do to fulfill himself emotionally. It is not needed to successfully accomplish a crime, but it is the reason he undertakes the particular crime in the first place, end quote. For some offenders, it may be tough to tell the signature apart from the MO because they may satisfy the same behavior. However, it is important to remember that two different offenders can do the same behavior for di very different reasons. And these behaviors can be a result of any number of external influences or motivations. This is just another reason the job of a profiler is so tough. Let's look at an example of two different crimes and see if we can find any similarities. Do you see any patterns that would suggest an MO or signature? These two scenarios are almost identical. The red highlights the information that could be the suspect's MO. In other words, it is how he committed the crime. The blue highlights some possible signs of a signature. Perhaps he was fulfilling needs of greed by extorting money, fulfilling sexual fantasies by having sex with the victim, or perhaps fulfilling his need for power and control by toying with the police. Do these two scenarios sound familiar to you at all? They actually describe the two situations that Jordan Vandersloot was involved in. Remember, he was the Dutch citizen who was suspected of killing the American student in Aruba, which is actually scenario one. And he was actually later convicted of killing a woman in Peru, which is scenario two. Makes you wonder how many other women there might have been. Another way that profilers attempt to identify a suspect is by identifying the crime scene as organized or disorganized. The state of the crime scene is presumed to say something about the offender's criminal sophistication and personality. An organized crime scene reflects an offender who commits crime out of a need for power. The Motivation is typically associated with psychopathy. It's hypothesized that characterized of or characteristics of organized murderers include at least an average in intelligence, interpersonally competent, skilled work preferred, sexually competent, maybe inconsistent childhood discipline. They have usually controlled their mood during the crime they may have some precipitating situational stress. They will probably follow media accounts of the crime. And they may have high geographic mobility. And they tell this based on some of the characteristics of the crime scene, where an organized crime scene typically shows that it was a planned crime. They may have a controlled conversation with the victim. The scene reflects control. They may have used restraints. The body may be hidden. Weapon or evidence may be absent. And there may be evidence that they transported the victim. Whereas a disorganized crime scene reflects an offender who commits crime out of passion, compulsion, frustration, or anxiety. This is because a disorganized crime scene 
is likely to have evidence of a spontaneous crime. There was probably minimal conversation with the victim. The scene is most likely to look random or sloppy or look like there was sudden violence to the victim. There's more than likely minimal use of restraints. The body may be left in view, weapon or evidence may be present, and the body may be left at the scene. And these sort of crime scene characteristics are hypothesized to be characteristic of disorganized murderers because they may be below average in intelligence, interpersonally incompetent, prefer unskilled work, be sexually incompetent, have experienced harsh childhood discipline, have anxious mood during the crime, or live or work near the crime scene. Based on this categorization, profilers have different interrogation recommendations. So with an organized person, they suggest you confront them directly, you respect their competency, probably just want to have a one-person interview, um, don't expect to just get free information out of the person, and they're going to be too small for, smart for you to use false evidence. As for disorganized, the interrogation should be motivated by forming a relationship with that person and expressing empathy and continually having a constant stream of conversation so that you can get some free information. You're going to want to use that positive personal relationship. As with anything that attempts to place behavior in one of two boxes, there are problems with it. Some arguments have been that these typologies oversimplify and provide, when law enforcement professionals use them, and those law, law enforcement professionals tend to have little academic training in criminology, psychology, and forensic science. And it actually encourages continued unsophisticated profiling. Secondly, it creates a false dichotomy because few offenders and crime scenes actually fit in to an organized or disorganized crime scene completely. There are most likely to be elements of both. Let's look at some famous profiles. One of the first profiles was developed in 1888 by Dr. Thomas Bond when he formulated a profile of Jack the Ripper. In that year, Jack the Ripper terrorized the east end of London, strangling and slitting the throats of at least five prostitutes. Well, the number is actually a matter of some controversy. Regardless, the murders were daring and gruesome. The women were attacked and killed on public streets. Their bodies were mutilated and in some cases, internal organs were removed and taken from the crime scene. They still warm, mutilated corpses were discovered lying in the streets soon after the Ripper had fled the scene. Dr. Bond performed autopsies on two of the victims. Here are his speculations about the physical and psychological characteristics of the Ripper based on the characteristics of the crimes. He stated that he is a man of great physical strength, most likely based on the fact that the Ripper managed to swiftly subdue his victims and none were able to escape or successfully call out for help. Dr. Bond stated, the Ripper is most likely a man of great coolness and daring which he based on the fact that the savage crimes were committed efficiently and in public places where they could have been witnessed by passers. Dr. Bond assumed that the Ripper is an external appearance is quite likely to be a quiet, inoffensive looking man, probably middle-aged and neatly and respectably dressed. He based this on the fact that the Ripper managed to enter and exit the crime scene without detection so he apparently blended in and did not call attention to himself. Dr. Bond said that the Ripper must be in the habit of wearing a cloak or an overcoat, 
which he based on the fact that it would have been impossible to kill and mutilate his victim swiftly without getting blood on his hands and clothes, and a large cloak or coat would hide the blood. And he also thought that he may be solitary and eccentric in his habits. Also, he is most likely to be a man without regular occupation. And he based this on the fact that someone capable of such depravity would have difficulty interacting with others without raising suspicion or discomfort. Unfortunately, Jack the Ripper was never caught, so the accuracy of Dr. Bond's profile cannot be assessed. However, it appears to be the first systematic profile offered to assist pol police in a criminal investigation. Let's look at another profile. The profile of the Olympic bomber. Although profiling has been most famously applied to cases involving serial killers, profiling techniques have been used, with varying levels of success, in the investigation of many other types of crimes, including bombing. One notorious profile was produced in response to a bomb explosion during the 1996 Summer Olympics in Atlanta, Georgia. Based on evidence uncovered at the scene of the bombing and on other database of past bombings at public events, the FBI instructed police to search for a single, white, middle-class male with an intense interest in police work and law enforcement. Within days, the police focused their attention on Richard Jewell, a security guard at the Olympic Park who fit the profile in every respect. Mr. Jewell became the target of intense investigation. Because of the need to reassure people that the Olympic venues were safe, Jewell's name and photograph appeared in newspapers across the country, and his face was shown on television news programs in several countries. It appeared that the bomber had been caught. Only after three months, long after the Olympics had ended, did the FBI admit that they had uncovered no evidence linking Jewell to the bombing. Of course, the damage to Mr. Jewell's life and reputation could not be easily undone. In 1998, after much additional investigation, the FBI finally charged another man, Eric Rudolph, with the Olympic bombing. Rudolph was an anti-abortion activist who was wanted in connection with the bombing of abortion clinics in two states. He evaded police for several years but was finally captured and convicted of the bombing in 2005. One of the most famous profiles ever produced was one of the most detailed. It was used to help solve the Mad Bomber case in 1957. In 1940, an unexploded bomb was found on a window seal of a building occupied by the Consolidated Edison Company. The note attached to the bond, bomb explained, Con Edison Crooks, this is for you. The person who became known as the Mad Bomber managed to terrorize the public by successfully planting, and sometimes detonating, bombs in locations dispersed across New York City. He sent several letters and placed a few phone calls to the New York City Police Department and the New York Times. Just after the United States entered World War II in 1941, the Mad Bomber sent a letter to the police declaring that because of his patriotic feelings, he would, quote, make no more bomb units for the duration of the war, end quote. He was true to his word. No more bombs were found until 1950. But in the same letter that informed police that his patriotism had inspired him to suspend bombings, he also declared that he would later return to, quote, bring Con Edison to justice, end quote, and make them, quote, pay for their disastrously deeds, end quote. Police were baffled. In 1956, they consulted a prominent local psychiatrist named James Brussel in a desperate attempt to generate new leads. Dr. Brussel reviewed the Mad Bomber's letters as well as other information in the possession of the police. Brussel directed the police to look for a man who was between 40 and 50, Roman Catholic, foreign-born, single, and living with a brother or sister. He would be suffering from progressive paranoia and would be a, quote, present or former consolidated Edison worker, end quote. In an especially precise but odd detail, Brussel told police that, 
quote, when you find him, chances are he'll be wearing a double-breasted suit, buttoned, end quote. The man the police eventually arrested, George Metesky, was a single, unemployed, 54-year-old former employee of Con Ed who was living with two older sisters. When the police took him into custody, he was allowed to go into his room and change from his bathrobe. He emerged from his room wearing a double-breasted blue suit, buttoned. Metesky was convicted. The police, the profile of the Mad Bomber turned out to be eerily accurate and entered the folklore of profiling. However, in addition to the accurate details that may have been helpful to police, the elaborate profile constructed by Dr. Brussel also contained inaccurate details and wild psychoanalytic speculations. For example, noting that the mad bomber had cut open the underside of theater seats to stuff his bombs into the cushion. Brussel offered the following analysis, quote, could the seat symbolize the pelvic region of the human body? In plunging a knife upward into it, had the bomber been symbolically penetrating a woman or castrating a man? In this act, he gave expression to a submerged wish to penetrate his mother or castrate his father, thereby rendering the father powerless, end quote. Brussel also noted that the handwritten W's in the bomb's, bomber's letters resembled a pair of female breasts as seen from the front and could also pass for a scrotum and that the bomber's yearning for what he called justice was truly a belief that people were, quote, trying to deprive him of something that was rightfully his, the love of his mother, end quote. It is important to note that it was not his preference for double-breasted suits that helped investigators locate George Metesky. Police did not stake out men's um, clothing stores. The crucial information in Brussels' famous profile was that the bomber was a resentful employee or former employee of Con Edison. It was a search of employee records that led to the identification of Metesky, a worker who had been injured by a broiler at Con Edison. His disability claim was denied and he was eventually fired from his job. It appears that Brussels' profile merely prompted the police to do what they should have done in 1940 when the first bomb was discovered, search the employee records. Indeed, if modern-day police officers found a bomb with a note about Con Edison crooks, they would almost certainly examine employee records to generate a list of disgruntled former employees. Of course, the task is far simpler today than it was in 1957 because employment records are now preserved as computer files. Indeed, the critical information that led to the arrest of Metesky was found in letters he wrote to a local newspaper. In those letters, he made the following admissions that he was injured on a job at Consolidated Edison plant and that the injury occurred on September 5, 1931. These specific details enabled police to focus their search of the employee records. Despite surging interest in profiling, and well-publicized anecdotal evidence suggesting that profiling is effective, systematic research has been slow to develop. An early study conducted in England questioned 184 police detectives who had used a profiler to develop leads about the identity of a criminal. Although most detectives reported that they found the process helpful, Profiling led to the identification of a perpetrator in only 2.7% of the cases. When researchers examined the actual profiles created for the police, they found that most profiles were riddled with inaccuracies and inconsistencies. Although this study has been criticized as limited because it relied on the potentially biased self-reports of detectives, other research methods have also been used to probe the process of profiling. An early experimental study was conducted by Anthony Pinizzato and Norman Finkel in 1990. That study compared the accuracy of profiles produced by four different groups, undergraduate college students, clinical psychologists with no profiling experience, police detectives without training in profiling techniques, 
and police detectives who had completed a profiling training program offered by the FBI. All groups evaluated two actual cases, a homicide and a sex offense. The crimes had already been solved, so the true characteristics of the offenders were known. All groups evaluated the same evidence, crime scene photographs, information about the victim, autopsy reports, and reports written by officers on the scene and detectives investigating the case. Analyses did re reveal differences among the groups. The biggest differences were between the trained profiler group and all other groups. The experts studied the materials more closely, spent more time writing their reports, wrote longer reports, and made more specific inferences about the characteristics of the offender. But their profiles were significantly more accurate only for the sex offender case. For the sex offense case, the profiles constructed by the profilers were twice as accurate as the profiles constructed by the police detectives, and several times more accurate than the profiles created by college students. Although these findings were intriguing, they are not conclusive. Unfortunately, there were only six people in each of the groups that evaluated the crimes, and the profilers were probably more strongly motivated, motivated than other groups to offer a detailed and accurate profile. In another study that followed up with a series of experiments comparing profilers to other groups, trained profilers, psychologists, detectives, science students, and professed psychics were compared on their ability to provide accurate information about the likely killer in a murder case. All groups were given a packet of information consisting of crime scene photos, crime reports, and other information investigators typically have at their disposal. After reviewing the evidence, all five groups filled out a questionnaire about the likely characteristics of the murderer, such as gender, age, ethnicity, marital status. Because the murderer had already been identified and convicted, the correct answers to the questions were already known to the researchers. Here is a summary of the findings across all of the studies. The profilers were slightly better at guessing the physical attributes of the murderer, but were less accurate than the other groups at inferring the thought processes, social habits, and personal history of the murderers. However, even when profilers performed better than other groups, the accuracy rates of profilers were fairly low, generally less than 50%. Although there are useful findings, one criticism of these studies is that the number of participants in the profiler group was quite small, with a total of 19 profilers when the studies are aggregated, with one study containing only three and another study only containing five. There are several other method methodological problems. Multiple choice questionnaires were used instead of giving participants a chance to generate a profile from scratch. Also, only a small number of profilers who were asked to participate actually agreed to be a part of the study. This self-selection bias raises the possibility that only the most confident or most motivated profilers volunteered. Finally, the profiler group completed the study away from the supervision of researchers. Perhaps the profiler group took some more time to consider the evidence, or perhaps they asked colleagues for input into their decisions. Other res researchers have attempted to determine if there is a sufficient stability and patterning in serial crimes to allow profilers to make valid inferences. In a careful analysis of the characteristics of 100 actual stranger rapes and the rapists who committed them, they coded each crime for the presence of 28 different characteristics, including the following, wears disguise, steals personal property, extends time with victim after assault, whether the rapist compliments, apologizes to, or demeans victim, user, uses surprise attack, blindfolds victim, binds victim, and uses weapon. The researchers then coded police records to learn the characteristics of the rapist, including age, race, education, marital status, living alone or with others, criminal history, and employment situation. They analyzed the data to answer these questions, and at the heart of the pro profiling process are similar crimes committed by similar people? The answer was a resounding no. No correlation at all. 
there was no discernible demographic resemblance between the criminals who committed very similar crimes. This stunning lack of correspondence suggests, at least for serial rape, that trying to deduce the attributes of a rapist based on his crime scene behavior may be worse than worthless. It may cause investigators to look for the wrong type of person. The credibility generally afforded to profiling as an investigative tool appears to be more a function of favorable portrayals in movies and TV shows than a function of solid science demonstrating its effectiveness. A review of the research highlighted this point. Researchers found that only 27% of published articles on profiling described research studies and that only 5% of articles focused on theoretical issues. The remaining articles were discussions of profiling and formal summaries of the literature or descriptions of how a single profile was developed and used in an individual case. This lack of, this lack of dispassionate research is critical. We cannot rely on the confident claims of practitioners of profiling because those practitioners have a strong personal and professional stake in promoting the perception that profiling is effective. In order for profiling to be helpful, it must rest on several assumptions. First, you must assume that the crime scene reflects the personality of the offender. Second, you must assume that both the MO and signature remain the same. And most importantly, you must assume the offender's personality will not change. Without these assumptions, it would be nearly impossible to form a profile of an offender. Some basic assumptions that under, undergrid criminal profiling have not been fully tested or validated. When the assumptions have been tested, they have been discredited by data. First, crime scene characteristics do not seem to fit into neatly bound categories such as organized and disorganized. Instead, they may fall along a continuum, with a few extreme examples being entirely organized or entirely disorganized but most displaying a combination of types. Second, particular crime scene characteristics do not appear to be reliably associated with particular criminal personality types. The data simply do not show us to conclude that if a crime scene has a particular characteristic, then the perpetrator must therefore be a particular type of person. Third, referring to vague abilities such as instinct or intuition or experience, should not be mistaken for clear explanations of the inference process. We do not know how the inference process of profilers works or how it should work. Another issue concerns how consistent the behavior of an individual criminal is across crimes. More generally, although there is considerable research indicating that aspects of our basic personalities remain stable over time, our behavior is also powerfully determined by the situation. For example, if we are trying to develop a profile of you based only on your behavior in a college library, that profile would be very different from the one we would create if we looked only at your behavior at parties, and that profile would still be different from the one we would create if we looked only at your behavior during your family gatherings. Context matters. In murder cases, the characteristics of the victim the setting and the emotional state of the killer can change. If changing situations lead to changes in the crime scenes, then the resulting profiles would change. Sometimes investigators erroneously conclude that two crimes are so similar that they must have been committed by the same person, or they erroneously conclude that two crime scenes are so different that two, two different people must be involved. The process of determining whether two or more victims are committed by the same person is called case linkage. Many profiles include speculations that are interesting but of little use to investigators. For example, Consider these speculations about the interpersonal traits of serial killers drawn from profiles. Unsure of himself. 
has problems with women, poor heterosocial skills. Do you know any males who are not occasionally unsure of themselves and that do not have problems with women at times? Do such speculations really help us narrow down the population of suspects? In an analysis of 21 American and European profiles created over several years, researchers found that more than 80% of the statements made by profilers were unsupported. That is, the rationales for the statements were not articulated. Further, nearly half of the statements could not be verified even after conviction, such as the killer has a rich fantasy life. Or, and more than a quarter of the statements were ambiguous and open to interpretation, such as he will have poor social skills. In 2005, the self-named BTK killer was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. As we talked about in the last module, he had killed at least 10 women, and his killing spree began in 1974 and spanned more than 30 years. Here is a list of the statements the FBI profilers offered to guide the Wichita detectives. A lone wolf type of personality. Immature sexual history. Heavily into masturbation. Women he's been with are either many years younger, very naive, or much older and depend on him as their meal ticket. He drives a decent automobile, but it will be nondescript. Lower middle class, probably living in a rental middle-class articulate. People might say they remember him, but don't really know much about him. In his mid to late 30s, and this was in 1984, might be married, but probably divorced. IQ at least 104, less than 145. This guy isn't mental, but he's crazy like a fox. Maybe connected to the military, a now person needing instant gratification holds a lower paying white collar job as opposed to a blue collar job, might wear a uniform for his job. He can function in social settings, but only on the surface. He may have women friends he can talk to, but he'd feel very inadequate with a peer group female. Women who have sex with this guy would describe him as aloof and uninvolved. Imagine that you were one of the bewildered investigators faced with this muddled portrait of an elusive killer. Start with the sexual conjecture. Look for a guy who masturbates a lot, who is sexually immature, who is aloof in bed, and who has been with women who are either much younger or much older than himself. Generally, these characteristics would not be easily observed by an eyewitness and would not be part of any searchable criminal database. Such information would conceivably be useful to know if you are interviewing suspects, but if, and only if, that information is accurate. Inaccurate information could cause investigators to spin their wheels or go down dead ends. In addition, even if these speculations were accurate, there are problems of ambiguity and verification. As really, what does lone wolf, not mental, crazy like a fox, and a now person really mean. A final problem with this and other profiles is the number of contradictory elements. The BTK killer would either be lower class or middle class, married or divorced, would like much older or much younger women, or would be average or way above average in intelligence. The actual BTK killer turned out to be a family man married with two children living in Park City, Kansas. He had spent four years in the Air Force was college educated and held a steady job at a home burglar alarm company. He had served as president of the Lutheran church he attended for more than 30 years, and he held leadership positions in the Boy Scouts of America. These sorts of specific details would have been very helpful in finding the killer, but these are not the sort of details that profilers are able to provide. The BTK killer was eventually caught when he sent a disc containing a letter to a local TV station. Investigators were able to trace the disc to a computer at his church. This case, like most cases, was solved not by a profile, but by painstaking police work and a slip-up by the criminal. Even when a particular suspect fits a profile,
police have an obligation not only to investigate evidence that links the suspect to a crime, but also to pursue evidence that may exclude that suspect from consideration. A serious problem that may result from a profile is what is sometimes called tunnel vision. For example, if a profile specifies a white male in his 30s who drives a large van, lives alone, and has disturbed relationships with women, and investigators rely on that profile, their focus will be diverted from plausible suspects that do not fit the profile. In this way, misleading profiles may enable criminals to evade capture. The improvement of profiling techniques will only come with enhanced databases for many types of crimes, systematic research that reveals the conditions under which profiles reliably lead to productive use of investigator resources and the development of standardized procedures for training profilers and creating profiles. Although profiling has been regarded as a promising investigative tool for decades, that promise has been yet unfulfilled. Two blunt assessments of the current status of criminal profiling are given. The first is from the president of the Academy of Behavioral Profiling, and the second is from a team of researchers who conducted a comprehensive review of the available scientific literature. An alternative to intuition has been geographic profiling and mapping. It is useful to contrast intuitive psychological profiling with another relatively established technique, geographic profiling, which is sometimes referred to as criminal spatial mapping. Whereas intuitive psychological profiling relies heavily on instinct and inference, geographic profiling relies on maps and mathematics. Key location, locations associated with serial crimes, particularly crime scenes, but also places where bodies have been dumped or where witnesses have spotted suspicious activities, are plotted on a detailed computerized map. Computer programs with catchy names such as Predator and Dragnet crunch the data to estimate the general vicinity of the criminal's home or place of work or potential location of his next crime. Often investigators assume that a serial offender stays within a geographic comfort zone and that he is likely to be caught in that zone. The spatial map can be quite detailed, including high crime risk areas such as bars, nightclubs, parking lots, areas around college campuses, rest stops, and jogging paths. As the number of crimes increase, so should the usefulness of the spatial map. Unlike speculations about the personality of the killer, the geographic profile has direct implications for investigators. It suggests where to place stakeouts, where to set traps, and where to find potential witnesses who have, been, who have seen something suspicious. The geographic approach has proven useful in some cases. For example, one such profile helped identify a serial killer who had killed women in several states. His victims were found along major interstate highways overlaying the spatial pattern of killings with major trucking routes helped police to find the truck driver responsible for the murders. In a similar case, the so-called railway killer was identified when investigators developed a geographic profile revealing that all the killings occurred near railway tracks. The killer turned out to be a transient who hopped freight trains to get from one place to another. Computer programs often look for an anchor point from where the attacks might be launched, and some assume a buffer zone around the home of a criminal where he is less likely to commit crimes. Many programs work on the principle of distance decay, meaning that the probability of an attack decreases as distance from past crime locations increases. <laughs> 